We're going to begin our conversation regarding slopes. So far we are aware and we know about the case of a flat ground surface where this is a profile or side view, this is a tree and this is the ground surface. Now there is obviously the case where the surface is not flat but sloped in which case obviously this portion here is called the slope. Now this presents a problem, let's call it a problem, that this case does not present. And that is that in this particular example the right side has a higher energy or potential energy than the left side, specifically points, right? So let's say that we choose a point here and we call it point B and another one here and we call it point A. Well based on potential energy we know that B has a higher potential energy than A and therefore without any additional energy there would be a desire let's say for point B to travel towards point A let's say for lack of a better word by the same token we can say that it is unlikely or it is impossible unless there is additional energy input for point A to travel up to point B. So if there's a movement of soil, it would occur in the direction pointed by this arrow, something like that, right? From this zone to this zone. So depending on the geometry of the slope and the types of soil, really the, the, the properties of the soil, the engineering properties of the soil, we, are, we could be close to having an instability, right? Which is this movement that we do not want, generally. Or we could be far from it. So, for example, if the slope were um, had a lower angle for the other conditions remaining constant, we would have um, less likelihood, let's say, of an instability. We could say that there are two types of instabilities or two types of engineering failures. Okay, so we're going to redraw our slope over here, maybe like this. And some of this stuff you're already familiar with, I, I would assume. So, for example, we know that when we have rain, um, the water that impacts the ground surface can dislodge grains, <clears throat> dislodge soil because of its energy, right? And so it can simply, for lack of another word, really the, the word here is can erode soil along the surface and so the soil can essentially then migrate down the slope. That's what I'm hoping to capture with these little drawings here. This is called surface erosion right and this example here that you may have seen uh, in the field just simply by looking around after rainfall or even during um, really reflects the notion of of the potential energy difference here as you would imagine and as you know the rain cannot cause the soil to erode up the slope right the erosion occurs always down slope towards less um, potential, from higher potential or energy to lower potential. This is called surface erosion. We could call this um, instability number one, or engineering failure number one, let's say. The second type of instability is called a slip. We'll go like this. Or you could also call it internal slip because it occurs within the slope or within the profile. And so what happens is this. Something, it could be rain, uh, it could be 
the placement of load on top here, close to the top of the slope, etc. But something may cause um, an additional force, let's say, or stress on the slope material. Um, or there could be an excavation on this part of the slope, right? So some kind of geometry alteration or or a load or strength of the soil change, right? So if this the strength of the soil changes because of a leak or something like that, then there could be an instability called a slip. And what happens is that a failure surface is created that is internal, this is a tree, that is internal to the slope. And so you may say, well, what, what is that? Well, this is the failure surface. And what it implies, because of the word failure, is that the shear stress along that surface is the strength of the soil. And so this wedge of material essentially rotates so that the soil on this side, which is not shaded, let's say that this is shading, right? The non-shaded portion of the profile remains static, whereas the shaded portion, which is the wedge, moves. So a particle here, for example, remains there during the failure, whereas a particle that is here, or let's say here, or anywhere in here, actually moves because this whole wedge is moving during the failure. Make sense? So at the end of the movement, that is where the material has now come to a stop, what you would find is that the slope may look something like this. So it's a rearrangement of the ground surface because of the movement of this so-called wedge. Okay, now I'll point something out here, but you will see this later, perhaps in, a <clears throat> in the next video when we actually do some calculations. But if you consider a point here, let's consider three points. This point, this point, and the point here. I'm going back to the, the the case where the slope is this slope. Not after the failure, but before, okay? Before everything has, has taken place. So this is the existing slope, point A, point B, point C. From the energy arguments that we pointed out up here, right? Potential energy. We know that <clears throat> point C wants to come down this way, right? But the question is, does point A want to move up or does point A want to move down? What happens is the following. The material down here requires energy to climb up, whereas the material up here can rely on its potential energy to fall down. The material here, if it were up to it and its potential energy, it would simply fall this way. So, part of the resistance to this type of failure, slip failure, yes, comes from the strength of the soil along the failure surface. These taus are all S's, strengths, at every point along the surface, every point. But also, there's a portion of the wedge, in this case it would be about this or so, that really wants to either remain there or move this way. Whereas it is this portion of the wedge that has the potential energy desire, right, to move that way as denoted, let's say, by this arrow. And as you can see, the difference between the shaded zones is marked by the bottom of the wedge. And maybe I'm going a little bit 
farther than what I wanted to in this particular video, but you'll see that that becomes relevant when we actually perform calculations. So what can we say about the role of the soil type on slope stability? Well, let's begin with core soil. This is core soil that is clean. Means that there's no fines, right? What's core soil? It's either sand or gravel. Or it can be a combination of those, right? But no fines, no cementation, clean. Okay, so what happens? Let's say that we have a concrete pavement that is flat. And you know that the concrete pavement, the surface of it, has a roughness that approximates the size of, for example, sand, right? So then you come with a barrel full of dry sand and you pour it on the pavement. And so what will happen is that you will get a mound of soil, of sand. And this mound will um, create, will be created, sorry, at a particular angle. We're going to call it phi REP. That is the angle of repose. That is the angle that the sand desires to rest at as a mound. Okay? And so if you wanted to increase this angle, the slope angle, obviously notice that this is a slope, right? So if you wanted to increase this angle, you would have to either bond the grains together or, well, basically pretty much that, right? Or change the soil type. A way to bond the grains would be to wet them slightly so that you get a sand castle type of consistency then you could actually have a vertical slope. But without any water or any bonding, this, the soil will, uh, will take uh, this angle as, it, as its repose angle. Obviously, you can have the soil at a lower angle, right? At a slope that is not as steep, but this is the steepest that it will go. This particular soil. This depends on the grain shape, etc. So, um, as an approximation, we could say that this angle would be similar to the friction angle that you would get from a direct shear test. Let's say if you were to run the test with a very loose uh, specimen of this soil. So maybe something like void ratio larger than 0.8 of the Emax, something like that. So that would be a, quite a loose, sorry, <clears throat> quite a loose specimen, which would then produce a fee um, that is the test would produce a fee that is similar to this angle that you would measure here. Okay, so in the case of uh, coarse grain soil, the physics is, is already kind of set because if it is only coarse soil with no fines and no cementation, then the maximum slope that you can get is this slope. Now, what happens if you run this experiment underwater? So let's say you go scuba diving and you do the exact same thing scuba diving. Well, you will get the same angle, basically. Okay, so for coarse grain soils that are, that are not cemented or bonded, we understand that slopes are essentially governed by this angle. Now, what happens if we have the opposite? Now, you may say the opposite is basically <clears throat> pure clay. Well, that's one example of what we could have in the other extreme or in the other side of the story. But really, the other side of the story, I would say, encompasses all other soils. Meaning that <clears throat> Sorry, all other soils right there. <clears throat> Meaning that if we had a sand with, I don't know, 20% clay, then in terms of slope stability, the approach would be very, very similar, if not the same, as the case of having a soil that is 100% clay. So this is the exception, and then the rest 
is kind of the rule, which is the natural soils that we typically find, um, which are soils that contain all sorts of different soil types in them, right? So clay sand, silty sand, sandy silt, gravelly clay, clay gravel, etc., etc., right? <clears throat> so the point is this, if we have finds uh, in our soil, then our soil is likely going to experience or behave in a way that that its strength and its its um, let's call it bonding ability in between the grains is governed by the fines. So we're talking about other soils, right, that have fines, and the addition of water because water is generally present when we are concerned with slope stability, generally. I would say 95% of the time, just as a, to give you a number. In those particular cases, we have to run or conduct analysis to determine the level of stability of our slope. So generally what we're going to be concerned with are slopes that are composed of soils that are not clean, coarse soils. Uh, soils that are wet or will get wet or are wet and will get more wet. <laughs> okay. And also um, soils that contain enough fines such that their consolidation rate is slower than the speed at which the slope fails. And so in that case, we're talking about undrained conditions, undrained. And because of that, the relevant parameter generally, because of these situations, tends to be the undrained shear strength. And so we are going to be using the undrained shear strength to analyze uh, the stability or to determine this or quantify the stability of, of a given slope. And that will come next.